Abdul Rasak Gurna. Uh, such a pleasure sitting here together with you in this grand hall belonging to the Swedish Academy. Uh, you are very welcome to Thank Stockholm. You. Thank you very much. Uh, and it is actually in this room that the permanent secretary every year uh, comes out, he enters the room from those doors in front of you, and he announces the new Nobel laureate in literature. And in October 2021, it was your name that was announced. I believe that he called you just in advance, just to let you know, uh, before everyone else knew. Do you remember that call? Of course, yeah. Um, I was just coming in from, um, from the garden. Uh, it was around about lunchtime, just before lunch. And so I was, uh, I guess I was about to make myself a cup of tea and kind of debating what was there to have for lunch. And the phone goes. And these days, and I'm sure you have the same thing here, we get a lot of these cold calls. Um, and I found that, um, uh, I don't, I'm not saying this is a, 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 you know, a revolutionary discovery or anything like that, but I found that if you don't speak, then the other end hangs up, as you were, because I guess it's computerized or something like that. Uh, so I didn't speak. And eventually somebody very softly says my name. And I said, who are you? Uh, and he said his name, but of course it didn't mean anything. And then he, I said, what do you want? Like that, thinking a plumber or somebody trying to sell me something. And he said, you've just been awarded the Nobel Prize. And I said, oh, come on, get off. What do you... What is this, some kind of a prank or something like that? But Matt Malms, of course, who was the one speaking to me, he then very courteously, politely, as you know, his voice and his manner, and just kept saying, yes, you have. If, you're, if you don't believe me, go to the website, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. Uh, yeah, so I went to the website. So it was just before 12. I think by the time I got to the computer, and actually logged on and got the Swedish Academy website, he was just coming through those doors. And uh, he started to speak in Swedish. But in the middle of this speaking, I heard my name. So I thought, yeah, well, it must be true. <laughs> because really, until that moment, I really was dubious about it. I thought, nah, what is this? But then there was. And then after that, it was impossible not to believe because the phone rang immediately and continued to ring really for another few days. And in the end, I just unplugged it. <laughs> so I can't take this anymore. <laughs> he did say your name and he also said a, a prize motivation uh, that comes with every Nobel Prize kind of a way to summarize or to um, point out the essence of the achievement or the work. The motivation that followed your name in this room in 2021 was for his uncompromising and compassionate penetration of the effects of colonialism and the fate of the refugee in the gulf between cultures and continents. So. On the note that it is hard to, to um, compress decades of writing into one sentence, can you find this description adequate? Well, it's, uh, this is what the uh, committee uh, wanted to highlight in their reading and understanding of the work, and it is accurate. Um, but of course, as you've already suggested, it isn't what I would think of as the complete account of, uh, of what I'm interested in or what I do. And I understand the difficulty. I mean, it's not, after all, you're talking about uh, 10 novels, and even one novel is difficult to put in one sentence, which is why it's a book. <laughs> so it's quite reasonable that uh, if you're going to make a statement about a lifetime's work, it's going to focus on whatever it is that you want to uh, prioritize in your reading. It's not going to say everything that's important about, about that reading. <clears throat> but I don't argue with it. I certainly don't want to argue with the Swedish Academy for any reason anyway, but, but I don't argue with that. It seems accurate enough in, in what it's, uh, in, 
a part of what I do, I think. Yeah, indeed. Another frequently used theme in your novels is memories. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the characters that bear memories of all kinds. Um, they, with pain, uh, with lost, um, me memories of another place, another time, other people. Um, how do you remember the place where you grew up? How in what sense? I mean, I do remember a great deal. In any case, um, <clears throat> I've, I've also been back and have had some of those things prompted by uh, my sisters or friends and so on. Um, <clears throat> but also, I think uh, for me as a writer, um, that's the hinterland of my imagination, if you like. So I go there a lot. Um, and often, it's often when you start a, a, tr a train or a trail of memory, other memories also come. Um, and so you remember, oh yes, something else comes back because you've now thought about this. And as I say, people often tell you, uh, <clears throat> One of the interesting things about being away from uh, Zanzibar for so long, that there are so many other people who are also in the same situation, who've been away for many years. Um, and sometimes we meet in another place, like Stockholm. Um, and then it does become possible, do you remember we were at school together? Something like that. I do, and sometimes I don't. And so that way of sort of prompting each other uh, keeps memories alive. But I think it's probably because of that writing um, process, which are rather, in some ways, rather unfortunately, is constantly going back to, for me, my practice, I mean, going back to certain events. And so it's very hard to forget, <laughs> even if you wanted to, because uh, not all these memories are happy memories, and not all of them are things, uh, uh, moments to celebrate, and they're not just because I'm thinking of uh, traumatic memories for myself, but also just simply because there are certain things you wish you could not keep remembering. The, the environment as such was a very, as you have described it, cosmopolitan uh, environment, uh, and you, just to add to that, you grew up next to a harbour. Uh, can you give us um, a picture of of that house, even street, that close environment? From our house upstairs, you could, you could look towards the harbour. Uh, I mean, you could see the harbour, but you could also see the warehouses uh, of the harbour. You could also see the traffic on one side. On this other side, you could see into the old harbour, which usually was sailing uh, boats and uh, fishermen's crafts and so on. Um, you could also see uh, other warehouses. So we lived in literally five minutes to the sea, if that. When a ship was coming in, uh, a flag used to go up on uh, a tower. I don't really know why, maybe it's to announce the um, the country of origin of the ship, I don't know, but from our house you could see it. So you think, what ship's coming in? <laughs> uh, we we're very, very close indeed. Um, but in relation to that traffic of uh, people from different parts of the Indian Ocean, literal, that I was, I referred to in By the Sea, for example, um, during the Muslim, during the monsoons, then they would pour out uh, of the sailing ships, most of, the, most of them, some of them had motor uh, propellers, but most of them were sailing ships. Um, and they would just pour more or less literally into, our, into the square in front of our house. You, know. That's, you would see them, uh, still smelling of the sea, still smelling of the, you know, the filth they'd been living in on the boat for several weeks as they were sailing, or indeed sleeping on the merchandise, so you could probably s smell that on them as well. You know. It was great for, for us as as growing up as children and so on, uh, and youths, it was great to see this great variety of people. Um, in earlier times, my mother's sister, my aunt, they lived in a different place, of course, 
but from where she lived, she um, could see in a different direction down towards the harbour, because, you know, very close. But she also spoke about this crowd of people in a different way. So at a different time, the presence of all these people was also menacing. Um, in particular, as the season was drawing to a close, so as the season draws to a close, the wind direction changes and begins to blow in the direction, northward direction, which then means these people begin to go away to wherever, to Somalia, to South Arabia, to the Gulf, etc., all these places, India and so on. Then it was dangerous because sometimes children were kidnapped. Uh, so it, that's how she recalls it when she was a child, not as this terrific, uh, exciting thing, but that parents told their children to stay indoors as this, this movement away begins, because sometimes a child would disappear, and you can only assume that that child was stolen by one of these and taken away. So it wasn't all fun. Was, there was another side to it, which was uh, the, I suppose, the danger of um, these are uncouth sailors sometimes, you know, they're just people on the make to some extent. So I mustn't romanticize it when I say these things. But they leave things behind. They leave their merchandise, they leave their stories, uh, the knowledge of other places and so on. Um, and that's what makes it cosmopolitan. When, whenever uh, I, I listen to a person that talks about his or her childhood, it's you can always look at it as upon chapters. And I tend to do that with my own life. Different chapters, I mean, it's a construction and, and not true, but, but it's um, maybe helpful, I don't know. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking of um, when you are 18 and you are forced to leave Zanzibar. Um, I imagine that is another chapter that starts uh, coming to another different country in every possible way. Um, how was that? Mm. Now you're talking a moment ago about memory. Now that is an episode that I can recall pretty much step by step, um, uh, almost uh, day by day as it was, because it wasn't just one sort of get on a plane and go with the various things that one had to do to to get the paperwork sorted out, to hide this, to hide that, to find money and so on. So it took a few days to, to actually make that. I can recall that in great detail. This, this is what I meant about there are certain moments, I think, that, that I never, never go away. Well, it was, generally speaking, um, exciting um, and relatively trouble-free. Uh, I traveled, my brother and I traveled together. And um, when we got to London, um, the uh, immigration officer looked at our passports and said, uh, what, are you, what are you here for? And we kind of said, uh, uh, just visiting, you know, tourists, um, which, because we didn't have anything else to say. We didn't have like, uh, an educational institution or something like that, which would have been another thing to say, we're students or whatever. But no, we're just tourists. And there was something like you had to have 400 pounds to be allowed in as a tourist. You had to show that you had enough money to be able, you can't just say, I'm a penniless tourist, because they don't want you if you're a penniless tourist. So we had borrowed, we'd been told that this was a requirement. So we had had to borrow 400 pounds uh, from a relative, um, just to be able to say, yes, we have 400 pounds. And the guy pulled us out and took us into a room and asked us more questions. And so I don't remember the questions I must have been, but then I was probably too excited to take everything in. And I said, yes, okay, okay. boom, boom, you're in. Uh, it will be different now, of course. Um, so in some respects, I think it was a kinder time in that respect, in the sense of immigration. Even though there was another panic going on I didn't know that, but there was another panic going on about immigrants, um, this time from mostly Asians, from East Africa, Asians as they were called, people of Indian ancestry um, from East Africa who had been, um, I don't know how, 
Well, the British in the hubris, I think, uh, as they were uh, decolonizing various places, particularly Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, Tanganyika, rather, as it then was, offered them the opportunity of retaining British passports. Um, I guess, not suspecting that they would need to use them to go to the UK, uh, but that they would use these British passports to travel around or something like that. Anyway, as a result of uh, various uh, policies of post-colonial governments in all these three states, the Indian community, the Asian community started to panic. And very quickly, as you might suspect, the government's going to close this down, get a lot of the rumors start, and so great numbers of them begin to leave, and they arrive in the UK with their British passports. Uh, and there's no way of saying no to them. We don't want you, but there's no way of saying no. So there was this great panic going on to do with that. But I didn't know that. So I arrived, I think, at a moment of um, a racial panic of this kind, which is regular in the UK, and regular in other parts of Europe, but it's regular in the UK. In the UK, the target changes a little bit. It was West Indians, then it was Asians, Pakistanis, uh, then it was Zimbabweans, then at the moment, of course, it's Afghanis and, and Kurds and Syrians. But there is, it seems to me, this regular outburst of uh, panic about immigrants. So I arrived in the midst of that, which was news to me. Um, I didn't fully understand it at the time. Uh, and it was quite hurtful to, to somehow be included in this hostility. But on the other hand, it was an adventure. It was a new place, it was things to see, understand, learn, um, and also it was painful in other ways because of, of being away, so far away from home and so on. Yeah. It was a mixed thing. 18 is not a child, but it is a very, you were a very young man. 18 is very young, yeah, especially, I think, um, an untraveled 18. Yeah. You know, I mean, some 18-year-olds these days have been around the world. Yeah. But uh, I think, you know, we were just sort of uh, coming out of uh, a little island off the coast of Africa. Hmm. And after you arrived to, to UK, your writing starts. You start to write, perhaps not uh, to become an, a writer in the beginning, but eventually. Yes, uh, it did. Rather, rather good, isn't it? It sort of worked out. <laughs> <laughs> Very practical, yes. Yeah. It worked out fine. I think at some point, at some point, I think when I, was, when I finally did begin to study literature, uh, which was maybe about four or five years from when I arrived till I was actually finding myself, I thought at that point I was then writing. Uh, and I was also studying literature, and I thought what I would like to happen in my life is to have a, an academic career, to teach in a, an institution like this, where I was studying. Not necessarily like this one, because I like this one so much, but you know, an academic career. And I also want to be, would like to be able to have a career as a writer, to, to, to write. So it was great to be able to say it worked out. Yes, it definitely did. Did you know from the beginning, but kind of from the beginning, what you wanted to write about? I had, a, I had an idea, an idea that I wanted to write about um, where I had come from, the place I had come from, uh, thinking about various dimensions of it, you know, like, for example, um, as things came back, I think, why did we live like that? Or why was it that we chose to do things in that way? Um, why were some parents, so this is not my story, but why were some parents so brutal to their children? Why was there uh, this kind of unkindness within families sometimes? Um, and of course also the, the horribleness of the terror state that I had been living in. I wanted to think about that and to write about that. Uh, I think I say in the uh, Nobel lecture that I said that there were, there, were, there were several things that it seemed to me was necessary to do if I was going to write. And uh, 
one of them was, was to write about where I had left, or indeed why I had left in a way. So it's not so much about me, but you know, to reflect on that and to, uh, to kind of fictionalize that, which is what I do, I think, in well, I hope, in memory departure. But I was also, by then, and uh, it took a long time for that book to be published, uh, and in the meantime, I was also living uh, in the UK and experiencing UK and coming to understand that and the complexity of that and the complexity of being a stranger in, a, in another place. Not just sort of hostility and whatever, but a variety of other things. And how you live with, uh, with your imagination and your memory of another place. So if you said, what, did I know what I wanted to write? I knew I wanted to write about those things. Um, I wanted to write about the other place first, and I wanted to write about being in, in, in England there and working there. And it had been such a, such a full experience um, of working, of living, um, and of living with things that were unforgettable, that there was no problem about what to write about, really. The problem was writing it, but not what. No. In literature, there are heroes and there are gods and there are kings and, and, and superpower protagonists. Uh, the characters in your novels, uh, they're not like that, uh, are they? They're, no, they're not. No. Can you they're little people on the whole. Uh, which is not to say they are uh, people without ambition or aspiration or whatever. So I, yeah, so I, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't necessarily an intention from the beginning that I would uh, I would focus on on small lives as it were and how and how people cope with trauma and with disappointment. Um, but um, but I, I think I, I admire that resilience in in the <clears throat> in in the human spirit, as it were, to uh, to to do so, to 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 recover, to reconstruct, to retrieve uh, uh, something meaningful out of traumatic experience or out of, as I say, disappointment or bad luck or whatever. And I think I don't write about heroes because I think there is something quite uh, predictable or almost um, a cliche about celebrating heroes. They're already heroes. Um, but I think there is also something heroic in small lives in, in the way it's yeah, so that's why I've, I find myself ending up there often with writing about ordinary people uh, coping with, um, like I say, I like this phrase, sort of retrieving uh, a life out of after trauma, which is precisely because uh, that's what I've written about in Afterlives. So I think that's the most recent <laughs> formulation, as it were, that I have of this idea of, uh, of re retrieving something. Being a, a, a writer is also being a reader. Uh, and um, now you have joined the crowd of 120 years of Nobel Prize awarded writers. Um, are there any precious literature laureates that you like to read and, and, and perhaps returns to in reading? Yeah, um, I, there are. It's great uh, to join this team. Yeah, it's very nice. It's very nice. Uh, it's also because so many, or the more recent of these, are writers that um, whose work I've taught and admired. Uh, in some cases, the writers I have met and have known, um, and st and still read. I know that you have been writing about Volosuyinka and and, and and Naipaul as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I admire uh, those writers, the Jem Kudzir, um, Nadine Gordima, Walcott. Um, uh, those are, are writers whose work I taught as well because of my uh, 
special interest in post-colonial literature. Mm -hmm. But there are amongst them also uh, writers whom I haven't taught, uh, but whose work I admire too, Ishiguro, Tony Morrison, um, let's say Tash mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, they're all there, they're great. Yeah. Good. There are odd one or two odd ones, but you know, I'm not going to mention those. <laughs> <laughs> we'll focus on, on the one you like to read. <laughs> yeah. If we go back to the motivation, the prize motivation, um, the word compassionate is mentioned. Um, and as a reader of your novels, I do find, even though the brutality and, and um, discrimination and, and pain of all sorts at different levels are present, compassion is also present. Um, what do you put into that word? What does it mean to you? Mm. I think, uh, I think uh, what I referred to a short while ago, to what I admire about um, the resilience of the human spirit, as it were. Um, I think one of the more important things about that human spirit is our capacity uh, for kindness. I know we also have an enormous capacity for cruelty and unkindness, um, and we can't do anything about that. It seems to me that there is a kind of monstrous dimension uh, of the way we are. But there is also this other possibility always there of, uh, of people being helpful and uh, kind to each other, of people being uh, perhaps not as straightforwardly uh, representable as we think they are, even when, when they are in the process of perhaps doing those uh, monstrous things. Um, so this is not to forgive anything or to say, it's all right, we're all human beings, we all make mistakes or anything like that, but it's also to understand that um, in thinking again of afterlives and perhaps the German officer in there, that it's also at times very difficult for an individual to, to allow the expression of that kindness or sense of wrongness at injustice because of the way they're compromised by their state or by their society or by the sanctions that rule their lives. But I like to think underneath that people know when they're doing those monstrous things and when an opportunity arrives, maybe, maybe they might be capable of doing the kind thing. So I guess that's what compassion means. Yeah. We spoke about chapters earlier and um, maybe being a Nobel Prize laureate is a new chapter. Um, oh, yes. I, haven't, I haven't done it before, no. No. <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. So how, how's it going? How do you enjoy it? Oh, it's great. Well, we've just been talking a moment ago about joining this team. <laughs> I mean, that's great. It's a... Yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, recognition as it were of, mm. of the work that I've been doing to be told, yes, we think you're, mm. uh, we think you're doing fine. Uh, it's a great honor in that respect. It is, of course, uh, it makes uh, my life very busy, but I hope this will only be for a while and that it will then settle down to something uh, less busy. I understand that it's not something that uh, that irks me at, at all, I and mean, I think this is, this is what it means. This is a, a global prize, a global recognition, and people want to know you and to hear from you. Um, and indeed, most wonderful of all, to read you, to, to read your work. Um, so that's fine, I'm going along okay. But of course, the body is what it is, you know, I can't, if you're working, it more than it likes, then you get tired or something like that. But that's aside from that, it's the, in my mind. I'm I'm quite happy to to meet and to speak with people. Oh, well, we appreciate immensely that you are here. You. Um, you've said that something like s stories helps us to understand the world that we live in, uh, and I well that goes with good stuff and the bad things. Um, I want to thank you so much, Abdul Raza Gurna, uh, for uh, talking to us. It's and, a pleasure. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you so much.